Right. So um, today we have an amazing guest speaker who will share even more information with us about how the tobacco industry has targeted the Black community, and he is Dr. Philip Gardner. Dr. Gardner is a public health activist, administrator, evaluator, and researcher. For the past 25 years, he has worked on a variety of health issues, including hypertension, multiculturalism, AIDS, breast cancer, prostate cancer, diabetes, and smoking. For the past 20 years, Dr. Gardner has lectured around the country on African-American health disparities and menthol smoking in the Black community. Dr. Gardner recently retired as a senior program officer for the Tobacco-Related Disease Research Pro Program at the University of California Office of the President, a position he had been since 1997. Dr. Gardner is currently the co-chair of the African-American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, which is a group of Black professionals dedicated to fighting the plague of tobacco and has and is impacting African-American communities in California and all across the country. This is all so cool and inspiring. I couldn't be more excited to hear from Dr. Gardner today. Real quick, open up that chat box, put a couple of round of applause and some let's goes because we are all so excited to hear from him. Let's all give a warm welcome to Dr. Philip Gardner. Good morning, Dr. Gardner. We are so excited to hear from you today. Look, thank you for having me. So, Dr. Gardner, like I said, we are all super, super excited to hear from you today. Um, I'm sorry, you guys, just one second. Maybe I should just give a little background while you kind of figure it out. Yes, please. Um, um, I, let me just say to the folks in the audience, thank you for being here and um, having me. Um, usually I would do a, usually a, something like a 40 minute or so, 45 minute or so presentation on the, the targeted marketing of the tobacco industry of African Americans in the United States, which has been going on for um, over 50 years. I guess the short story is that coming out of World War II, the tobacco industry um, coming out of World War II, Black folks moved to the North, many of them, most of them, in segregated situations, and different companies took advantage of that situation and developed specific products for them, whether it was different hair creams for them or food stuffs like Uncle Ben's rice and stuff like that proliferated in the late 40s and early 50s. The, there was a um, survey done in 1953 that found that only 5% of African Americans smoke menthol cigarettes. And then after a series of focus groups done by Brown and Williamson in the late 50s, found that African Americans resonated with TV commercials and the messages that were in them um, much more than um, white folks. Um, I mean, literally we have data on this. Once they figured that out, they began to employ African-Americans in TV ads, um, in newspaper, and particularly magazines, Jet, Ebony um, magazines. You have to remember this is, the, this is during the time of the civil rights movement when blacks weren't even allowed to sit at lunch counters or get jobs. And indeed in 1963, um, Elston Howard, the um, catcher for the New York Yankees was on a number of them um, uh, printouts about um, the, you know, pushing um, menthol cigarettes. This is a time where the tobacco industry is hiring black um, executives in North Carolina. And at the same time, this is a time when the Birmingham um, um, church is being blown up or the March on Washington is taking place. So the tobacco industry is way ahead of the curve, way ahead of the curve. They began to use more black folks with more black features. By the early 70s, they had folks with afros and dashikis. They had basketball ads. By the 80s, there were the menthol wars, meaning that most of the tobacco industry, different brands, Cools, Camels, Benson and Hedges, Marbles, everybody came out with the menthol brand. By the 90s, they began to even develop cigarettes that were specifically targeted cigarettes for, for black people. There was Uptown cigarette that was created. There was X brand cigarette that was created. There was, there was the, for lack of a better term, there was the Black Joe Camel that was created. This, 
this is the punchline is if it was 5% in 1953, it almost tripled to 14% by 68. It had tripled again by 1976. And today we're at 85, more than 85% of African Americans who smoke cigarettes smoke menthol cigarettes. And that's because of the predatory marketing of the tobacco industry. Okay, thank you so much for that, um, Dr. Gardner. Sorry about the wait. Um, so we're gonna start with our first question and that is, why did you decide to focus your career on public health activism, especially how the tobacco industry targets the African-American black community? I think that's probably the most important question. Um, in the 1960s, I was part of the um, Black liberation movement, um, the civil rights movement. Um, I was in college at the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, involved in creating the Black Studies program there, got involved in the, um, the, the, the Black Student Union there. Um, I've been a political activist my entire life. That was in 68. Um, today I'm 71 years old and I've continued that activism. Um, I think the punchline to all of this of doing political work um, throughout my life, um, I ended up working at the University of California, San Francisco, most of the 80s. And the data, the, the, the data, the research that we mainly did was looking at the impact of um, certain social situations on different groups of people. Punchline being that one of the studies we did looked at bus drivers who were predominantly Filipino and African American and showed that driving the bus essentially raised your blood pressure and made you more tense and produced more cortisol in your system and et cetera. Following that experience, I went back to school and got my master's degree and my doctorate degree. Um, and I was living in a certain place in Oakland, California and driving, you know, 25, 30 miles to a job in southern part of the of Alameda County. And the job came up announcement that they were looking for a program officer in tobacco. And after just a little research, finding that African Americans died disproportionately of tobacco related diseases, I, I said, ah, oh, I can continue my quote unquote political activism through public health work. Um, I guess the real defining moment was in 1998 when the um, Surgeon General's report came out, the first one on um, looking at um, health disparities um, for different um, race and ethnic populations. And I'm sitting at my desk at the university, I'm sitting at my desk and I'm page after page after page after page is about how black people are dying disproportionately from stroke, disproportionately from lung disease, disproportionately from um, coronary heart disease. Um, and it just went on and I was like, wow. And then when you, not to put too sharp of a point on it, most of that was from smoking. From then on, I've been focused. And then when I dug into it deeper, what were black folks smoking? They were smoking menthol cigarettes. So then I kind of, I um, currently work with the the um, African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. We were formed immediately before the um, FDA took control of tobacco products. And of course, as you all know, um, there are 13 flavors excluded from um, cigarettes. The only one that was left in was menthol. It was straight up racist, it was unfair, and we have been fighting against it ever since. Currently, you should be aware that my group is suing the Food and Drug Administration for them dragging their feet of not making a ruling on menthol. Um, I think I'm getting close to answering your question. <laughs> um, so let me let me stop there. Um, no, that that's very interesting to hear, and I definitely agree. Like how blatantly obvious it is what their goal was by not banning menthol as well as all the other flavors. That's really interesting to hear about. Also, um, for any attendees or any other participants, um, if you guys get any questions while we are asking 
and talking with Dr. Gardner, be sure to um, put it in the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box, so we might be able to ask Dr. Gardner your question. Okay, so on to our next question. How can we help advocate for other communities of color or the LGBTQ plus community against the tobacco industry? Well, you guys are probably probably aware of this. Um, they target each community specifically, whether they're going to have ads in Spanish that um, attract the Latinx community, um, you know, or the whole thing they did with women, um, with you know the the slimmer, trimmer um, cigarettes and stuff like that. So they they they're pretty straightforward on it. I guess what was most alarming and you know. I guess it pisses me off essentially, is they launched the SCUM project. And many of you are aware of the SCUM project. SCUM project was um, subcultural urban marketing. And that was focused on um, LGBTQ folks, particularly in San Francisco, but in, in other parts of the country. And then they, what, what's interesting to me, it took them you know, a few months to realize, oh, SCUM project is, is, is prejudicial and we should call it something else. So they began to call it Sourdough Project. Um, but they, they have targeted specialty products to special groups all the time. And that's what they do. Unfortunately, it's had quite a um, devastating effect on the African-American community. But they target other communities. Let me just say, people that are interested in, um, in dealing with in their community against the tobacco industry is that you have to get in there personally and see how they're doing the advertising. Let me, let me tell you what they do in the black community. Um, the cigarette, there are more advertisements for menthol cigarettes in African-American communities compared to other communities. There are more lucrative promotions um, in the African-American community compared to other communities. And I guess what pisses me off the most is that cigarettes are cheaper in the African-American community than other places. So here are the most, you know, the people that are very oppressed um, are getting their death sticks cheaper. Um, it's, it's, frankly, it's outrageous and disrespectful, so. I, I totally agree. It's, it's honestly so crazy. It, they don't even try to conceal the targeting at this point, it's insane. Um, but obviously, you know, you're very knowledge on tobacco and all of that. So what was the impact of tobacco on your life or family when you were in high school? <laughs> I, I saw that question. Um, so in high school, folks should um, be aware, I was in Oakland, I went to high school from, um, 65 through 67. I lived in Oakland, California. I was a basketball player. I didn't smoke cigarettes. Um, and I, of course, you know, I tried it with my friends sometimes, but it was like, oh, these are terrible. Uh, um, by the time I got to college at the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, I played my freshman year. Um, and I got an injury in my um, sophomore year and had to in my basketball career, then I started hanging out with folks in the Black Student Union. And when I started smoking, this would probably be in the spring of 19, um, let's tell this lie right, <laughs> in the spring of 1969, um, I was smoking Winston cigarettes. Um, Winston tastes good like a cigarette should, you know, and like that. By the time I started attending regular um, Black Student Union meetings in the fall of 69, um, <clears throat> I was smoking um, cool cigarettes. And it became clear on, through that summer and the work we had been doing in the community in Santa Barbara, that when we would take a break, you know, everybody would pull out a pack of cigarettes. I was the only one who didn't have a cool cigarette. And that's how the marketing got to me. Um, it was through my friends and et cetera. I remained a cool smoker until 1987 when I quit smoking. Um, but that, that was, that was, I, I didn't, I, 
fortunately, I was an athlete in high school, and um, I didn't, I, you know, sure, I took a, a hit now and then, but it was like, this is terrible. I don't have anything to do with it. But then the cool, I mean, that's the whole point of why they put menthol in um, <clears throat> cigarettes. Look, menthol is an anesthetic by definition. It allows you for deeper inhalation. The more nicotine and toxins you take in, the more addicted you become, the more addicted you become, the harder it is to quit. And we have data on all of this. I mean, menthol inhibits the metabolism of cotinine in your liver. Cotinine is the, um, what, menth uh, what, what nicotine turns into when it gets to your liver. If you smoke menthol cigarettes, it slows down the metabolism of the, um, of the nicotine that stays in your body longer. Take it even further. It's the darker the color of your skin, the more nicotine stays in your body, or what, what we call melanin. Um, the melanin is what gives us all color. Um, and if you keep, if you smoke cigarettes, um, nicotine stays in the melanin. The other thing um, menthol happens is what we call greater cell permeability. Greater cell permeability means that if you smoke a um, cigarette product that has menthol in it, it uh, crosses the cell membrane much more efficiently than if it doesn't have it in it. So when you begin to add all these different things up, it stays in your body longer, it's greater cell permeability. There's even another factor we've compared. There's studies that show um, that folks that smoke menthol cigarettes um, have what we call more nicotine receptors in their brain, meaning the menthol creates a more, 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 they're more addictive. I mean, you know, in a, in a lecture, I could kind of go over this in a little bit more detail, but um, they're more addictive, they're harder to quit, um, they stay in your body longer. It's a setup, it's a straight up setup. Yes, that's exactly what it sounds like. Our next question is <clears throat> from an attendee. And the question is, considering everything going on to advance social and racial, racial justice, how do we support these efforts while still maintaining focus on tobacco? How have these communities prioritized tobacco control compared to other relevant issues in the spotlight today? It's a great question. Um, this is the way we kind of put it. Menthol cigarettes and flavored little cigars are the main vectors of death and disease into the black community. With the COVID-19 crisis, um, the COVID-19 crisis has exposed the underlying discriminatory nature of the history of the United States, such that different groups don't have the same uh, resources and access that other groups have. If there's anything that we could do now to make Black Lives Matter more um, and to save Black lives, by the way, that's the tagline of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, saving Black lives, is to get menthol cigarettes and flavored little cigars straight out of the black community. In fact, during this time, we've been able, during this time, during the pandemic, we've been able to pass legislation, um, at, particularly at the local level, um, restricting the sale of these products and making that argument that, and let's not get too into details, but smoking is, exacerbates um, COVID-19 and makes it make you more susceptible. Indeed, if you're someone who has COPD or you're a smoker, then you actually produce receptors in your lungs that attract the coronavirus. This is a great publication in the, um, in the um, European Union uh, Respiratory uh, Disease um, Journal that actually documents this. Um, so yeah, yeah, you, there's a way to integrate this. Um, if you wanna save black lives and black lives matter, then let's get these cigarettes and get these menthol cigarettes out of our community. That's how you tie them together. I wish they weren't tied together, but they're tied together like a knot. Yes, I completely agree. Um, our, we have another question from an attendee and it is, as the knowledge of targeted marketing is made more evident, do you see that there is a change in the situation? 
I, I saw that and I, I, I must admit, I did kind of look at the chat now and then. Um, this actually came up in another meeting earlier this week that I was in, and it was a similar phrase. There's, there's almost an assumption that now that it's been exposed for so many years, they're not doing it anymore. And that's just not true. All of those days, it's still cheaper. There's still more promotions. There's still more advertising. Um, there are coupons being given away. They're being promoted in black magazines. If anything, it has intensified. What is really, and I, I, I should have the more of the specifics here, I guess what has been really pissing me off is that the tobacco industry has been giving money to black organizations to fight COVID. <laughs> they're, they're just opportunists at the core. Um, let, let me make sure I get this out there because this may not be asked. The question would be, why did they leave menthol out of it in the first place? Was it just straight up racist? And um, I mean, wh wh why, why menthol? Why are we having the, why am I even here talking with you about it? I guess the punchline is this, that generally speaking, I guess these are 2018 data that the tobacco industry is somewhere in the neighborhood of a $221 billion industry. $221 billion industry. If you go to the FT, FTC, um, the Food and Drug Administration, no, the um, Free Trade um, 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 Commission, and look up and just type in FTC and menthol, they'll send you to charts seven and eight. And the punchline there is 36% of all cigarette products sold in the United States are menthol. Um, and that's actually rising. That's even larger than it was in 2009 when they um, let it stay on the market, the, meaning that you're talking about this is a $70 billion industry that these folks are into. Um, they're not, the, the Congress wasn't about to do this. And unfortunately, some members of the tobacco control movement agreed with that um, quote unquote compromise um, in 2009 that um, made this all possible. So um, now let me let me let me let me stop. No, you're you've been giving so much like good and interesting information. Um, moving on to our next question, we kind of talked about how um, mark how marketing is today, how it's been targeted to different groups, but how did the tobacco industry target youth when you were our age? What was the advertising or targeted marketing like when you grew up? I thought that was an interesting um, comment. Um, since I look, my, my I, I wasn't a smoker, so I, I wouldn't I didn't pay much attention to it. Um, I think what's true is both my parents smoked, um, and obviously I was exposed to uh, tobacco smoke all my childhood. My mother quit in um, 1963. I guess I was about 14 years old then. Um, but my father smoked until he died in 1977. In fact, there was a pack of cigarettes by his, by his bed um, when he passed. And of course, he passed of a heart attack and just from, from smoking cigarettes. So it had an impact on me. I didn't, I must admit, and I apologize for being a young man, being ignorant about it. I didn't pay much attention to tobacco advertising then, but truth be told. Yeah, we completely understand. Most, most kids our age don't even really notice it now either because it's so common. It's basically normalized at this point. So it's not really anything that sticks out unless you're interested like us you know and you're and you kind of talk about it all the time sometimes us and the TAs would send each other advertisements we see around in public and like oh my goodness like do you see this but if you're not really thinking about it and at, you know actively have it on your mind and sometimes it just you just pass by it and don't even notice it yeah. we actually have another question from an, an attendee um I think it was in regards to your last question and um, she asked which organizations took funding from the tobacco industry for COVID-19. 
Um, I don't have the the, 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 the the distinct data in front of me, but um, the tobacco industry gave over a million dollars away in Philadelphia to three notable black organizations. And I could look at, you guys could look that up. Um, and this is to help them fight COVID-19 and to fight racism. And here's the most racist backward group of people doing this. Um, let, let me just expand this broad, more broadly. Um, the tobacco industry gives money to as many people as they can. Um, some of us are involved in a campaign to stop people from taking tobacco money. And unfortunately, many groups, not all groups in the black community take uh, money from the tobacco industry. Unfortunately, we know that the national newspapers um, editors, um, National Newspaper Producers Association, um, Ben Chavis, who used to be the um, chair of the NAACP, takes money from the tobacco industry. We know that the National Organization of Black um, Law Enforcement Executives, Noble, takes money from the tobacco industry. We know that NAN, the National Action Network, which um, Al Sharpton has you know, come out in front and been very open in, in the fight against um, racism and um, for Black Lives Matter, he takes money from the tobacco industry. Um, the, the list, unfortunately, just goes on and on and on. Look at it this way, most civic, social, political, cultural, and religious groups in the black community take money from the tobacco industry. Um, there are some good exceptions. Um, the sorority of the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated um, passed resolutions in 2013 and 2017 to say they wanted, they they didn't support or they wanted to get rid of menthol. Um, and then 2017 said that they, their local chapters should um, involve themselves in this. Um, and then in 2016, the um, NAACP um, adopted a national resolution that um, called for their local chapters to join in the fight to um, get rid of menthol. I need to give propers where propers are due. The Delta um, resolution was advanced by Dr. Valerie Yerger. She's a member of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. And the NAACP resolution was advanced by Carol Magruder, who's the other co-chair. I'm one of the other, I'm the co-chair. We're the co-chairs of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, but she led the fight um, to get the NAACP to pass their resolution in 2016. So there are certain groups. Just recently, um, the, um, the National Medical Association, the NMA, joined um, myself, myself, and joined um, the um, African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council and Action on Smoking and Health and the American Medical Association to become a plaintiff uh, against the um, Food and Drug Administration. Um, for, for, for dragging their feet as it relates to menthol. Hey, Dr. Gardner, it's Kathleen here. Um, Charlene got kicked off, so I'm gonna hop in really quickly. <laughs> well, she's a, you know, the wonderful things about technology. <laughs> we have another question from an attendee. It says, Earlier in the presentation with the teen ambassadors, they were talking about uh, genetics and um, health equity and social justice, all of those things. So this question is, do you feel as if it's genetics that make people more disposed to using tobacco and the side effects of tobacco or historical trauma and the products that the industry markets to the African-American community? Well, it's certainly not genetics. I mean, I guess there's a, a three-step process. Um, you were drawn into this either as I was by my um, friends and colleagues. Um, and then there's the great taste 
of menthol. Um, and then why you keep coming back for more is that you become addicted. And I, I think many people kind of lose sight of the addictive nature. Um, cigarettes are probably the most addictive substance that we know. I mean, everybody talks about crack cocaine this or heroin that or um, whatever, <laughs> methamphetamines and et cetera. It's nicotine. I mean, there's a great article. I, I, I haven't been able to find it in a while and it used probably still in my office because I didn't get to clean out my office that well. A mat, there's a picture drawn in the early 1700s um, at about noon and it shows all these people lying around in some um, city square in some European city and most of them are drunk. Most of them are drunk. When the Industrial Revolution hit, you couldn't operate that machinery and be drunk. And what was so interesting is that in the 1800s, um, they began to find a, something that people could do that would allow them to get high and work. And it was called cigarettes. Um, I mean, it took 100 years to get cigarettes out of, um, you know, workplaces and out of hotels and out of restaurants. But this, this was quite a finding. Um, so yeah, no, this is about addiction. Um, um, methyl, methyl. Um, nicotine is probably the most addictive drug that we know. Yeah. Yeah, we know it's more addictive than heroin, alcohol, cocaine all those things. It's terrible. I see Charlene has been able to come back and join us. So I'm going to hop off so she can finish answering her questions or asking you her questions. Sure. So sorry about that. <laughs> but um, on to the next question. What advice do you have for a young person that wants to get involved and use their, their, use their voice to create change? I saw that question too. Let, I, I, I say this a lot, I mean, I, clearly not to you folks, but look, if you're getting to get involved in the fight against big tobacco, you're going to have to take the vantage point that you're involved in a marathon. This isn't a dash. This isn't a 100-yard dash or a 200-yard dash. <laughs> um, this is one of the most powerful groups in the world. Um, and... I think it's the right thing to do, if that's what you, uh, folks are interested in, is to get involved in it and be prepared that there's gonna be ups and downs, to put it, put it mildly, backwards and forwards. Um, it, it's not a linear process. Um, it's not like, oh, you're gonna get involved and then two years later you win and then you go on to something else. No, that isn't what's gonna happen. Um, and I think it's, um, I think sometimes when we're younger, that's how life kind of goes. But um, if you're really into saving black lives, if you're really into saving um, people of color's lives, if you're into saving women's lives, you're into saving LGBTQ folks, um, Latinx folks, Asian Pacific Islander folks, Native Hawaiian folks, Native Alaskan folks, and all the other people I forgot to mention, then it, 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 it means that you need to take the long road in terms of that. Um, be prepared. Keep, you know, keep focused on what you're doing because you're not going to win every time. Um, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, um, let me stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, this act, this question, I'm actually really excited for because this is something that I'm interested in. The next question is, what advice do you have for someone who wants to make a career out of being a public health activist? I think I, well, I, I saw that too. I think it's a great idea. I mean, you get to, do, it's about saving people's lives and folks should, if that's what you want to do with your life, I can't think of a better thing to do with your life. Um, 
you can fight AIDS, you can fight um, nicotine addiction, you, 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 you can do all of these things. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't think of it. I think when I look at it, you know, what about your life choices? Would, is this what you have chosen to do? Um, yeah, I've been in the fight for Black Lives Matter for over 50 years. Um, and it ends up now it's at the public health level. I, I can't think of a better thing. I wouldn't have done anything different. Not at all. That's really inspiring. Um, and our last question from this list is, what has been your favorite accomplishment in your career so far? I've had a pretty long career, you guys. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that, I guess there would be two things I had mentioned. There were a series of conferences that took place in the early 2001 and 2002 and one in 2009. They were called the first and the second menthol conferences. And what we were able to do was bring activists, researchers, um, political figures from all over the country together to focus on the issue of menthol. I think that's why today there are numerous cities fighting for menthol restrictions. Two states have passed uh, laws that prohibit the sale of menthol cigarettes. There's a court case against the tobacco industry um, that we're involved with with that. We testified in 2019 on HR 2339, which has been known as the Pallone Bill, that got championed by the Congressional Black Caucus um, that actually passed the House of Representatives. Now, of course, it sat on the floor of Mitch McConnell's office. It's still there, and we're trying to figure out where to go from here. But I, I, I think there's, there's, been some, there's been some good moments. Um, I guess the first moment, you know, I, I, I don't like to dice them up like that. Um, we were called into Chicago in 2013 when the um, health department there and the mayor were thinking of dealing with menthol restrictions. Um, after working there for a number of months and meeting with folks all over the city, particularly in the black community and clergy and folks and doing all sorts of things, Chicago became the first city to um, pass menthol restrictions by putting a buffer zone around schools that you couldn't sell flavored tobacco products. This has, um, of course, gone even further. Today, the standard is what um, San Francisco did in outlawing the um, sale of all flavored tobacco products, um, outlawing the sale of menthol and all flavored tobacco products citywide. And we're doing that in a number of different cities. So there's a, those, uh, those are some of the highlights. Um, I'll stop there. That's really cool to hear about. Um, our next question is from an attendee. And the question is, what does this long-term fight against tobacco look like to you? Will we ever get to get tobacco to be illegal? Well, that's a good question. Um, let, me, let me do it politically for you and then I'll do it. Um, you know, I have a minor in anthropology and I'm gonna to come to that. I have a doctorate in public health and a minor in anthropology. Um, Politically, there's a number of things that come up around the country where they say, well, why don't you just get rid of all tobacco? You know, what's so special about menthol other than it's killing colored people, poor people, women, and LGBT, other than the march, you know, like, why don't we get rid of all tobacco? So this came up first in Beverly Hills um, two, three, three, four years ago. Um, and we suggested to them, let's deal with menthol first and so we can protect the most vulnerable amongst us. And why don't you set up a commission to look into what would it mean to get rid of all tobacco products, you know, stop selling all tobacco products in Beverly Hills. So they agreed with us and they, out, they outlawed menthol um, sales in Beverly Hills. And then eight months later, after they 
you know, had numerous meetings on this, they came to the conclusion that we're going to not sell um, tobacco products citywide. I mean, I think there's a, a loophole here and there, but it's probably very a very strong place. I believe Manhattan Beach did the same thing too. So when this comes up, and it comes up often around the country, we have to focus on menthol first because it's attacking the most vulnerable parts. But if people want to go ahead and deal with all cigarettes, then they should take some time to figure out what that what that would look like and what that would mean. That's door number one. Yes. Door door number two. Let me let me do the second part, and you can um, kick me off. Oh, no. this. Yeah. Um, it would be. It would be. I don't want to say miraculous, but. Look, we used to drive around in cars without seat belts for a very long time. And now everybody wears seat belts. It's not even the discussion anymore. Um, to get to that type of place um, would take some a serious education. And, and what's interesting, I think the um, COVID-19 pandemic um, allows for some of that discussion to come up. Be aware that human beings have been using products and tasting things and ooh, what is this and ooh, what is that since, since, since they began. Um, I mean, tobacco was first used 9,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Um, it was chewed, then we learned to smoke it, and then, you know, it became ceremonial. Um, I, I, I think as a politician, we need to let's let's deal with what we have in front of us, and what we have in front of us is the tobacco industry paying preying on um, poor marginalized communities. Let's take that first step, and then let's see what our, where our next steps go from there. Okay, I completely agree. Um, okay, so unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for questions. I just want to thank you again, Dr. Gardner, for coming on and speaking up with us. We've all enjoyed you so much, and we can't use wait to use all this information for us to grow as advocates. But before you go, um, I would like to ask, how could participants read about your efforts or read about more information about saving Black lives? Um, you could go to um, the AATCLC's website, um, savingblacklives.org. Um, yeah, we had the slogan before the Black Lives Movement uh, Matter movement came up, um, and look at it there. Um, but I would just encourage people to follow the events do the science, you know, look, I'm, I'm a researcher by nature and I, I would sit at my desk and get into an issue and then you would dive into that issue. Don't, don't just take the newspaper article, look into the science. Once you get to the science, look into the pieces of it. Um, um, if you're gonna do it and I tell this, you know, I, I taught for a number of years, uh, a health disparities class. Um, you want to become expert in some part of it. Become an expert in it. Don't just become a casual involvement in it. Having said that, I'm going to let you guys go. Um, thank you, um, Charlene. Thank you, Kathleen. And thank the rest of you for having me.